Good afternoon once again and welcome to the second webinar of the day of um, the 2023 IHF Coaches and Referees Education Week. We had uh, Mats Olson earlier uh, presenting a webinar on uh, goalkeepers. Now we move forward to the line players, to the pivot uh, position, a very, very interesting one, uh, a position which had many, many developments in the last years and became more and more important in handball. My name is Adrian Costeu. I'm a member of the IHF media team, and I will be your host throughout um, today and uh, in the next days, in the last three days of the IHF Coaches and Referees Education Week. And uh, we will have the seventh webinar uh, of the week uh, right now with two very interesting panelists. But to begin with, uh, we'd like to let you know that these sessions will be in English, but the translation is available uh, in French, Spanish and Arabic, like in the previous webinar. So you just need to, uh, to go to the bottom of your uh, Zoom app. Uh, the interpretation icon is there, the globe icon, just click on it and then select French, Spanish or uh, Arabic. It's only at one click away. All these sessions are being recorded and are available on demand on IHF ihfeducation.ihf.info. Uh, um, and like I've said, in the seventh webinar, uh, the topic is the pivot play, and um, it will be presented by Per Morgan Sodal, the chairperson of the IHF Playing Rules and Referees Commission, and Glenn Solberg, um, Sweden men's national team coach. Gentlemen, the floor is yours, and you can start your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian. Can you just com confirm that you hear me? Because I have uh, I have some internet issues. Yes, we can hear you quite good. It's good. Good. Now. Yeah, good. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe for you, because it's not so much to look at. You you are not able to. Uh, you are probably not able to see me. But uh, I have been so lucky that we have uh, got also Glenn Solberg, which, uh, like Adrian said, is not only uh, the coach of the Swedish national team for men, but also a former top, top player from Norway, join, joining me. And this is also uh, underlining uh, the big, big importance about the cooperation between the refereeing side and the coaching side. In IHF, we are using um, coaches a lot for referee, also for refereeing education. Can be specific topics like, for example, passive play, where the where the coaches, are coach, coaching experts are doing more or less all education of the referees. While a topic like we will have today, the pivot play, is uh, more of a joint uh, challenge where both the refereeing side and the coaching side are working together as we will do today then you can change to the um, uh, to the agenda please first glenn will make a short introduction also about uh, how he's uh, he is looking at uh, the challenging uh, challenges in the pivot zone uh, uh then i will do the same and tell a little bit about how we are uh, what kind of focus points we have then we will go more to a um uh, to a uh, yeah more video explanation sequence with the first violations uh, from defenders then we will show something about uh, blocking and then also some uh, uh, blocks that is a little bit more than an illegal block. Then we will finish with some final words. If you have questions, please ask them, and we will uh, and we will uh, make room for questions after uh, every segment. So I think uh, I think now, uh, Glenn, you can uh, if we then go uh, two slides forward. So we come to the uh, from the coach's point of view. Then uh, then I give the floor to you, Glenn. And um, I think also we as referees have a lot to learn now. So you better listen very carefully. I think that will be uh, many good advices coming now from Glenn. So the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me join you on this uh, 
online education week. Um, I don't know if you will learn something, but uh, I'm very humble uh, and I understand there are different meanings and we see, think differently. But, uh, but I think uh, important is that we uh, develop together and uh, have understanding for each other because it's very complicity, I think. Um, first of all, um, I have huge respect for the referees and all the difficulties they are facing in our sport. The, there are so many marginal situations, difficult situations. And um, I uh, had to say I support you and I uh, hope you get the best condition to develop uh, because the, the sport is getting faster and faster, faster and it's, it's difficult. Um, and I think that's very difficult for the sport. Um, the pivot area is, of course, one of the most challenging, um, both for referees and players. Um, and I, um, as I see it, in general, I want or would like more tactical play and less physical play in that area. With that, I mean less fighting and less wrestling and more thinking. Try to have focus on the ball, where the ball is, and less focus on the play. Try to go around pivot and not wrestle him, and the same opposite for the pivot. Working on timing in block, understand the movements and block tactical, not only physical, if you, if you understand what I mean. For the pivot to get in the right balance uh, is extremely difficult now. So they need to come in the right position with the right balance, with the feet and body in good positions. And that's extremely difficult to judge. As we see, it's extremely difficult to judge who is starting and who is not playing correct. So this area is very interesting, and I'm looking forward to the next hour to discuss, talk about this. This is challenging for, for, for all of us, for the players, coaches, and referees. Um, as I said, and that's maybe my my big point here uh, as a coach and it's my opinion and i'm all, always talking in my opinion and i'm also of course humble and understand its different meanings um, uh, there are different opinions and sometimes there are no conclusion above all but in my perspective i would like to see much more uh, much less wrestling and fighting and more the tactical and thinking game for both parts. I want that everybody should focus on the ball. As you see today, they are fo much focused on the players when the ball is uh, on the opposite side. So uh, the, the, the defender need to work around the pivot more than wrestling with him. Uh, maybe stop the running of the pivot, not with hands and body, but with tactical moves and fast feet, and the pivot should try to time the blocks with right timing and the right understanding and move to the right positions, not block with arms, feet, and body. For me, another thing that's interesting to discuss and to be aware of is the question, what, what is an illegal, illegal block? Must the pivot stand completely still, or can he be in movement? How much can he can the feet be extended? That's a very difficult thing. I, they need to have wide feet to have the balance. But how wide? Here we can have a huge challenge for all parts. Uh, another another situation, another case is the defender who is tactical or using the goal area to get benefits from it. We will see clips of that later on. But I, I think we can see a lot of these uh, things these days. For a defender is easily, you can easily go around a perfect block of a pivot using the goal area and, and stop another play. Well, and that's my, my opinion. It's easy uh, to get away with 
but should be punished more. And that's that's my opinion. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Glenn. Um, some some re, some really good points there, and I don't think uh, yeah you say you are hum humble. I think we all should be very humble when we speak about this uh, topic. Also very humble, uh, like you also uh, so nicely said about uh, how the complexity of this, both for referees but also for the players. Mm -hmm. I have uh, one more yeah. point, if I can say that. Yes. This uh, this is also very challenging, but but you can see. Uh, the pivot, big pivot, physical pivot is standing in the front of a defender and just throwing him back to, to get a, a penalty or two minutes. That's also, I think, you can see a lot of, lot of uh, these days and um, too many are getting <laughs> uh, penalty or two minutes in that, uh, is my opinion as well. So... For me, it's important that we are protecting our game and protecting the tactical game and should reward technique and understanding over fighting and wrestling. That's the last thing. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully not the last thing, because uh, I think you have started. Uh, I think you have started very well. Uh, the f what we are uh, uh, teaching the referees to have focus on uh, now before our events. Like uh, before the men's world championship now in Sweden, Poland, these were the focus points for the referees when it came when it came to the pivot play. This is exactly the slide the referees were shown, and also the uh, the participating federations and teams were shown before the tournament. And here we can divide it into uh, into three parts. We have the uh, what the defenders are doing like if, like glenn said if they are ball orientated working around the pivot with quick feet or if they are uh, using some other methods to gain space like holding and grabbing uh, for moving around the block and of course also using the goal area to move around the block which is sometimes a sh shortcut also, we look at the behavior when uh, the pivot is positioned behind the line player or behind the pivot player. Pushing, holding, grabbing here also. Yeah, Glenn uh, explained situations where, uh, where the pivot is just leaning back. Uh, but it's also situations where he is held so hard, so he is pulled down. And when you hear the word pulled down by a defender, then the answer uh, is always a di uh, direct two-minute suspension, also in the pivot area. Also, we see pivots that are in front of the, li of the, of the line player. Uh, so, ball side, but to keep the line player as close to possible uh, as possible to him or her, the defender then sometimes then grab the shirt of the pivot while moving forward, for example, to tackle a backcourt player ready to shoot. Um, and that's also, of course, not allowed. This is uh, also a violation for uh, with the purpose of then keeping the pivot as close as possible. A lot of this uh, is happening then before the ball uh, is entering the area where the pivot really is. But we are also a lot of duels where the pivot has the ball. Um, and then if the pivot wins the one against one, what does the defender do then? What we want the defender to do is when he's realizing, okay, this one against one, I cannot win because it's not possible for me to move uh, to move my feet in the feet quick enough to come in a, in a position where I still can monitor the defender or not the pivot or uh, get in front of him. Uh, and then the 
yeah, the defender must choose between still hold. That must have a consequence. Or if the uh, if the uh, if the defender then release, of course it shouldn't be punished. But of course you cannot hold, 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 and just release in the last second. You must release at once when you when the one against one is lost. Going to the attackers, kind of a main principle here is that an attacker. In this uh, case, then a pivot or a line player should not be allowed to do more against a defender than a defender is al allowed to do against an attacker. That means if the body contact and it's a violation and the body contact is strong enough that you have whistled a free throw, if the foul had been done by a defender, you must then whistle an illegal block and a free throw also uh, in favor of the defender if the attacker is committing this violation. So we are looking at then, you are uh, also the pivots are allowed to monitor the defender using then bent arms, but he's not allowed to use stretched arms or grab the shirt of the defender just as the defender is not allowed to do that against the attacker. Then we come to a difficult area, which is the wide foot position. It's written in the rules that you are not allowed to extend your body. Therefore, the feet should not be wider than the width of the shoulders. Uh, that is very difficult uh, for uh, pivots. In this area, where you have uh, maybe uh, three, four players inside uh, very few square meters, and you fight for you fight for the position, to you cannot behave like uh, a small girl or a small boy uh, standing in line on the first day of school in their life. Of course, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of fight for the space. But here also, I can recommend in the future the IHF app for rule interpretation also, where we will uh, soon show clear examples about where the uh, where we should put the line, and you will also see some examples here. And like Len said, we also have this stable, unstable position of the pivot, where uh, if it's just he or she is leaning into the defender. This is, of course, not also allowed. Also careful about where the arms are, both in the block and also in the reception of the ball. Of course, you are not allowed to have any arms uh, towards the throat and face area of the opponent. I think, Glenn, if you can help me a little bit here when we speak about uh, direct and indirect blocks, where, uh, what's the trends here? A direct block, by that we mean is a situation where the pivot is blocking the defender that is uh, in direct opposition of the player with the ball. But an indirect block can happen a little bit longer away from, uh, from where the ball really is. And uh, therefore, it might also be a little bit more difficult for the referees to de detect. So if, we, if you can see, uh, say a little bit about the trends, how you see this in uh, the modern hand modern handball today? Yeah, uh, we, we, we see now that uh, almost every team now are, are using the pivot to uh, standing in one position and run away from that position to get Free space, a free uh, space for one to one again for, for other players, and then uh, there will be possibilities to 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 do block on uh, on the other side. So you you can see a lot of that in in this game, and most of all, I think we can see that um, now uh, the defender are are maybe are trying to uh, stop. The, the pivot to, to run um, because there will be a more compact defense uh, when if it's not running. So um, 
Oh, uh, as you said, uh, if the, the block is um, happening uh, uh, on the other side where where the players not uh, are attacking, it's 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 of course difficult for the for the referees. But um, yeah, it's uh, the game is uh, developed, and um, and I think uh, uh, the question about blocking is uh, very interesting to discuss uh, later when we see the clip as well. Yeah. In general, then a block uh, should be in a passive position. But here we are also a little bit back to the young young girl and boy at the first day of school. Uh, I, some small movements, we, of course, we, it's natural. We have to accept it. But of course, very, very active actions uh, against the defender to uh, while doing the block is, of course, an illegal block. Here, as for example, we will have a lecture later this week about offensive fouls and seven meter. Important question here, who has the space first? Who owns the space? Mm -hmm. Also, who achieves an advantage of the violation? If, <laughs> because here, yeah, the referees should react to the first violation they see. But uh, sometimes they can feel that the violation, uh, a violation from the attacker and defender are more or less happening at the same time. Both are grabbing each other. Then who achieves the, the advantage? Then we have made that criteria that the decision should be taken uh, against the player who receives uh, or gains the advantage. And also here, yeah, if a defender is making a, a violation, but the, the attacker has an advantage. Yeah, play the advantage because that's an advantage for uh, the attacker. But then if the defender is making a violation, has an influence on the situation, but then the attacker is making a violation after that, then you have to stop the, uh, the situation. This will also reduce the physical play. Clearly, if we are able to whistle early, also, when we are whistling against the attacker, whist, whistle early. It's so difficult to sell this if you are whistling when the, uh, when, the, uh, when the line player is hanging in the air or jumping in the air with no players uh, with any body con contact to him ready to shoot. If you are starting to sink, then, then, you, are too, then you are too late. So next slide, I will start to move a little bit uh, quicker because this is, uh, if I might have the next, yeah, I have the next slide. Thanks. Um, so it, it's natural that it gets physical, but we, we want to avoid what Glenn also is speaking about, wrestling, rugby, uh, yeah, you can call it res wrestling, rugby. We are humble. We, don't want that everyone is holding everyone in this area. So a uh, line that where, where we just say, okay, survival of the fittest, that's not, uh, that's not good enough from our side. We have to take decisions. And the way you do that is from the begin, already from the beginning, show the line. Tell the players both, uh, then, Hopefully also, and we really encourage you to use your personality, your body language, your communication skills to tell not only uh, the players involved in the situation, but both teams, the spectators in the arena, hopefully the millions watching in the, the game at home also, what is the line, what is allowed, what is not allowed. Also. Um, like in the previous, my previous lecture, we spoke, uh, I spoke a little bit about the balance between attackers and defenders. Uh, maybe also here as a general thinking or not, not maybe for sure here as a general thinking, we need more decisions against the attacker to change this balance a little bit, but it's an adjustment, not a revolution. So then going to the next slide, explaining a little bit about what kind of decisions we can take. 
uh, of course, play on when the if if it's a bad pass and uh, and uh, def and the defender is not preventing the pivot for uh, to reach this pass or if it's not committing any violation at all, of course, play on, create flow. But if it gets too physical, what we call big free throws also can go in early in the game, whistle a big free throw, high whistle, strong, uh, with quicker movements, body language, personality, telling the players, what do you want them to adjust? Not only say stop this, but tell them what they need to stop. Because if you say stop this, then you communicate only to the player making the violation. But if you are really showing what they, you want them to stop, then you will reach so many more. And of course, we need more decisions, uh, illegal block decisions, and we need punishments when it gets too physical. That, me that, uh, that means that just uh, you have to uh, you have people being uh, or players being pulled down to the floor uh, then just a normal free throw without without uh, without anything it's not a decision it will not help you control this area then I think we have made our introduction uh, Adrian if you have any questions to uh, questions now you uh, it's a time for that before we start yes. to watch on some uh, video examples we have one question yeah. and I think it's directed to Glenn um, what do you uh, search for in in a line player uh, also to have very good physical strength or to be very uh, intelligent and how do you develop both skills? in a line player because i think from my part i think both are important oh uh yes that was a huge big uh, question uh, and um, that also belongs to uh, the young younger coaches in in sweden and norway uh, where i'm coming from but uh, i i i would like uh, uh, both physical and and um, tactical and smart uh, line players i think for me, uh, as a coach, I'm looking for um, uh, the game. I'm looking for players that understand the game, a good understanding for the game, uh, and a uh, tactical good. I think uh, we see now, uh, and the development of the game, that we see players are more, uh, more and more tactical and technical good in all positions. And uh, maybe uh, in for five, ten years ago, you could have one shooter, but today um, you need to know and uh, have more than one skill. Uh, you need to understand the game. You need to have technique. You need to have good movements. You have a good shot. So for me, it's it's very important that we have um, players that have a lot of skills and, and um, huge different skills. Uh, and to develop that, it's um, it's uh, depending uh, where they come from 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 youth, and uh, we need to to learn uh, the um, uh, skills, uh, the basic skills for for everybody. That's uh, important. And and um, where I'm coming from, uh, the line play maybe I say maybe because I don't. Um, no, hundred um, percent. But I say maybe that the line player, and the pivot, is not getting the real uh, education from our coaches. It's um, because we don't have uh, um, the the education self as as coaches. So it's um, it's important. Uh, thank you, Glenn. So uh, you can start the next part of of the presentation. Uh, with the violations from uh, from defenders. Good. Then we go, then we go there. Um, a little bit of a a, ch a a change in the thinking of our approach here. Uh, while uh, before we were like uh, referees are thinking, okay, first time we just do something, we tell them to stop. Second time we uh, we then give a yellow card. 
and then the third time as a part of a progressive punishment, then the player will get the two-minute suspension. Uh, we think a little bit different now that we give one clear message. If, uh, if, if the defender is really doing something that's not good against the pivot and it's not a violation for a direct two-minute suspension, if it's a violation for a direct two-minute suspension, you take it immediately. And of course, also if it's a red or red and blue card. But if it's, if it's a kind of a progressive or uh, close to progressive situation, then this big free throw again, you can use a yellow card, but make sure that the yellow card is not the star of the communication. The star of the communication is your explanation why you are giving this yellow card or if you choose not to give a yellow card, that's also, that's also okay. Still, the explanation why you want them to adjust. Because then the players have, uh, the players have uh, two opportunities. Uh, you can go one slide back again. You are a little bit too quick for me now. Uh, that may be also a hint that I should speed up, but uh, I will try to do that also. Uh, then the player ha the players have two uh, they, they can they can choose either they uh, adjust then all is fine this is of course what we want because the role of the referee is to lead the game be a manager preventing things from happening or of course if the defender choose to continue then it will be so much easier also to sell the next step as then a uh, suspension, not then a yellow card if you didn't give a yellow card in the first situation. Because, uh, because I told you so. I got this, I, uh, I gave you this information. This, uh, this, uh, this is, of course, with situations happening inside very short period of time. It's not like of course, if you tell if you tell them to, to stop uh, or with clear body language and so on in minute number one, and then in minute number thirteen you have a situation that requires uh, which is a progressive punishment. Of course, then you can give the yellow card. But here we speak; it, it's not looking good if you are telling uh, if you are telling a player to, uh, player to adjust, and then later in the same attack is doing exactly the same. And then he's just receiving a, receiving a yellow card. That's uh, that's uh, that's not uh, that's not enough. We must expect the players also to react to our signals a little bit earlier for reducing the physical play in this area. Then we can start showing some uh, clips with the next uh, on the next slide. Also can wait for the replay. We see the pivot is held. The defender has lost the one against one. Yeah, also the defender turns uh, comes uh, then in the end a little bit from behind. But then immediately when she's realizing that, uh, that the one against one is lost, she releases the player. Free shot from the pivot with full ball and body control. Goal, a modern attractive handball. Goal, no punishment. And then we continue then in most cases with a quick, uh, we get with a quick throw off. You can also communicate to the player, the, to the defender, that ah, I, saw, I saw you. It was good, uh, good that you released so early. You cannot hold her any longer. But there, uh, so you also have some positive communication. I don't know, Glenn, if you would you have expected as a, a punishment after such a situation? No, I think uh, I think first of all the defender are handling the situation perfect, and and the judge as well. That uh, it's nothing, it's nothing much. It's nothing. So uh, my question is, uh, does the pivot getting penalty if she miss here? 
because we can see sometimes we are trying to get lost and then they are not getting gold and then they get the seven meters. So, but in this situation, I think the she's will will not get a penalty or. No, I'm, I'm completely agreeing with you, Glenn, because uh, here we must judge if it's uh, if this violation, uh, of course, it's a clear chance of scoring. That's clear. But if this violation takes away ball or body control, and here, no, she jumps in freely. Yeah, maybe she's losing a little bit of momentum, but not enough for us to say that this is... Uh, this is a scoring chance taken out, taken away from her if she's not scoring a goal here. So giving a seven meter in this situation would be giving two chances. And we don't want to give two chances. We. Like we like we say, like we see here, clear uh, clear example of modern. Good handball. Then we can take the next uh, situation. Here, she, uh, here the defender is doing a yeah, little bit opposite of what the, what the defender did in the previous situation. The one against one is lost. She's from behind and she continues to hold. Even if she is releasing uh, here uh, at some point, it's too late. And here also watch uh, the other defender using the goal area. Here. Um, even if we say this is a goal, this it, uh, this violation has such an impact on the situation. It's a yeah, more or less a pulling down and also from behind. So here, no matter what, we want a two-minute suspension. Also accepted, Glenn? Yes, it's accepted. <laughs> Uh, I would just also say that sometimes it's very difficult to get lost because you are working so hard to get around the pivot or, or trying to get the ball and then it seems worse than it is. But of course, you see here that uh, you should try to get lost uh, much more uh, earlier. Yeah. Next one. Here, uh, a little bit familiar face is, uh, one, uh, is one of the benches. It will now come uh, three examples from uh, this game. I don't know, Glenn, if you want, uh, you, can, you can start commenting this one. Uh, yeah, I can. I can. It's very challenging, uh, and that's also one of my questions with the, with the pivot. And uh, can he be in movement when he is blocking? And that's a, a huge and very, very difficult uh, situation for all of us. But of course, uh, what I want my um, uh, Daniel here should do is that to try to work around the pivot. Uh, to get the ball because he will lose 10 again, 10 uh, fighting with the Fabregas. So, but he should not take his shirt, of course. But you can also see here that, that Fabregas is in movement and it's very difficult for Daniel to get around him. Um, but um, when you take the shirt, I think it should be punished. This is a, also from our side. This is a, it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky situation because, uh, yeah, uh, Faber Gai is a little bit in movement. Yeah, maybe he owns the space, but if we look at his left leg while he's uh, while he's setting the block, 
it's quite wide, so you can argue that the leg is a little bit extended. But that doesn't have so much influence on the situation because the, here the yellow defender, he's pulling the shirt, and when he ends up from behind, he continues to hold him. Mm. Uh, therefore, he is uh, pull, pulled down and also with the help of his teammate. So here, uh, I think the, cor the correct uh, decision is that we continue with a free throw and, uh, and a direct, a direct two-minute suspension because of the holding of the shirt and the holding from behind. Mm -hmm. Next one. <laughs> And here we are in this area where we can say this is rugby, wrestling, whatever. Maybe if you are in another sport, you will get some points for an ippon or something. But uh, here, uh, two players are pulling each other down to the ground. It's very difficult to see who's the guilty one. Of course, then the referees should punish both or none. In general, we are saying that we don't want double punishments because the referee should detect who's doing the first uh, violation and take the decision based on that. But in such a tricky situation, uh, situation as this, it's the one of the few times we can say, okay, giving a two-minute suspension to both is acceptable. Do, do it have to be two minutes or as a coach <laughs> in my opinion I would like two yellow cards but that's maybe difficult if one of them have a yellow card from before I don't know but I don't yeah you yeah you uh, here you have the perspective the the, uh, the perspective you said the the finish with yeah it shouldn't have an influence that one of them uh, already have a yellow card or something like that or uh, already have a two minute suspension so then the player cannot get a yellow card or shouldn't get a yellow card mm -hmm. but here it's more about the violation itself here it's two players pulling them uh, pulling the other one down to the ground so it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit more uh, also based on the rules here uh, where uh, pulling up pulling up opponent down to the uh, down to the ground is a direct two minute suspension so it's more more using this is a, a little bit of the reference from the for the uh, from the referees if you don't think it's a pulling to the ground then it, instead of giving yellow card to both then i would clearly prefer that the, the referees are using clear clear body language to both players telling both players what they shouldn't do and the, that this has to stop right away but in general, this is uh, here. I will clearly accept a two-minute suspension to both players. Then we can go to the next one. Here we see what we don't want to see from uh, defenders when they are run, uh, when they are trying to move around the pivot. Uh, the image itself, when a shirt is then yeah, pulled over the head of the attacker, uh, it doesn't create a good image for our sport. Yeah, we know also in my country or also Glenn's country, but he's now working in a, in another country, but also in my country. And we know we have uh, pivot players that are very good having their shirt pulled completely over the head. But here we see so clear violations from the defender 
that uh, uh, that a two, the two minute suspension here is very clear and this is also for protecting the image of our sport. And now also, uh, now we have seen three situations inside 16 and a half minutes of the game. And for sure it was, it uh, was also more showing how physical it can be in this area. Any comments before we go to a clip that I know, or a sequence that I know that you will have a lot of opinions about, Glenn? So just that I agree on what I was uh, saying before that I want a defender that working around the, the pivot, not pushing. So I think it's correct. And I like that kind of punishment. Yeah. Then you can continue watching, uh, watching the next clip. You can run this now. Come yeah, yeah. Clip, uh, yeah, yeah. Th this uh, one is for you. This is one for me. Yeah, yeah. Now um, uh, it's about the, the goal area. You see, um, the players are tactically using the goal area a lot of times in this clip. Um, and you can easily, so easily get around a perfect good block, tactical perfect good block, just using the goal area. And Hopefully, you can see it's a lot, not only um, when you are fighting the pivots, pivot, but you are also seeing that now uh, with the um, wing players. They are using uh, the area to get faster to the, uh, to the wing. So um, I hopefully, and I will, um, I think that's very important that we are punishing this um, right away and not so they can't do that from the start of the the game and uh, have benefits from it yeah uh, clear instructions to the referees here also that deliberate use of the goal area we are not good enough to punish here yeah give this clear message the first uh, the first time but then if repeated we have to start punishing it and here, then we are we are a little bit. Uh, uh, it's a little bit different because here it's clearly written that uh, that clear that uh, deliberate use or repeated deliberate use of the goal area is uh, a, pro a progressive punishment. But then we have to start, and we have to start early, and we have to show the consequence if the, uh, if they are not taking the signals, and then this will more or less disappear because then they will then then they will think that the goal area is a dangerous place to be for a defender, as it, as it should be. We don't want anyone else than shooting players or goalkeepers inside the goal area. Next one. This is also about not taking the signals. We see first situation then, not the biggest one, but a lot of, uh, lot of shirt pulling. Here the referee, uh, referee comes with a yellow card, which here I wanted, uh, here I really had wanted a little bit more body language explaining you have to stop this. But then uh, later in the same attack, the pivot is pulled down from behind. Same player, of course, then show the consequence direct two minute suspension. Non ball side from behind, also clear chance of scoring here. So the game should have been restarted with a seven meter. The attacker has control of the ball 
empty space in front of him and he is pulled down from behind. I think we can take some questions now, Adrian, if uh, before we are going into the, the blocking part. Yes, Burr, uh, there are uh, a few questions. Um, if you could please um, talk about the guidelines of jersey pulling in these situations with the line players, so it can be clear every jersey pulling is sanctioned with a yellow card or a suspension. Uh. In, in theory, yes, but practically, of course, this is, uh, th this is not the case. And, but if we define the pull, the jersey pull as a pull where uh, the pull, it's not just the contact with the jersey, but it's a pull where you can clearly can see that the, the, sh the shirt is being stretched. Uh, or you or you can see that this pull prevents the 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 line player to move into the position he or she wants to move into then of course it's a punishment if the if this uh, if this is so hard that it's uh, it's breaking the shirt that's not a good image that's like pulling the shirt over the head of the def of the defender and also, if the pull is so hard that he's, uh, he's partial losing body control being pulled down, then we are on a direct two-minute suspension. Uh, Good. But, but, but the key here, Adrian, is that when the referees start to see these small ones in normal play when the ball is far away, and not so, not so big ones, but when they see the small ones, when, when the players are starting to pull the shirt, then show your personality. Show the referee, uh, the players that I, I, as a referee, I see this. I'm controlling it. I'm not allowing it. You have to stop. So you can prevent all these shirt pullings. Yeah, but we have to react stricter to shirt pullings from the uh, from uh, the defenders. Yes, when it has an influence on the situation, and when you see clearly that the shirt is being pulled, we have to react, and that means we have to react. Then also clearly with more punishments that we are, than we are doing today, clearly. Uh, and the other question uh, merges uh, a clear scenario which you presented with a hypothetical situation. It uh, refers to the situation uh, you've you've shown with I think Luka Karabatic and Oscar Bergendal uh, with the epon uh, you've you've mentioned. Yeah. If one of the players were uh, had already two two minute suspensions. Will would it be also uh, another uh, suspension which would uh, basically disqualify one of the players? <laughs> yeah, that's, but uh, that's but one that, question. Yeah, that's the responsibility of the player. Perfect. I think that's that's a clear and concise answer. Uh, you can continue with the with the presentation for Anglan, of course. Then we are moving to the blocking part, uh, where we, if we um, can uh, have the next uh, next slide, uh, with some just some keys for uh, decision. Who has the space first? Is the block active or passive? And you see these two uh, uh, these two marks around passive that a, a player a pivot standing completely passive. Uh, yeah, we know that that uh, it's not a realistic scenario. Extended body or normal position. What's the balance point? Then key for referees: who makes the first violation here? And then if more, if uh, two violations more or less at the same time, who benefited the most? And again. Attackers must be allowed to do the same against defenders as defenders are allowed to do against attacker. Now we will show up a, a picture sequence uh, just to explain uh, a typical situation. How here the white team is playing six against five with one player more. 
uh, what we what we see here in the first picture is two uh, yeah two uh, two players yeah they are fighting both with extended body wide feet. Then the next picture. If the central defender has now no central attacker has now received the ball and now trying to set up some kind of play. Then we can go to the next. Where you see also that the, the, the pivot is reacting to this. He's uh, now uh, making a transition from the half defender to the inner defender or central defender, preparing a block. Next one. And now we can see the block and now look at the feet. They are not in a normal position, they are really wide. Next picture. Then the defender is trying to come ball side uh, and here also prevent almost an a four against two, but at least a three against two situation. But this way around the pivot is no, now so much longer because of the width of the between the feet of the pivot. And uh, if you then show the next picture, you, we can see a little bit the consequence here. Is that the defender then is uh, yeah, falling falling over the foot? And here, uh, for us, it's a clear offensive foul or an illegal block in this situation. Anything to say about this uh, sequence, uh, Glenn? I think this is uh, something that uh, happen. This uh, kind of a scenario that can happen in a lot of games. Yes, and <clears throat> I think also it's 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 very difficult because. If you see the feet on the defender, they are quite wide. And we have this balance to get the, the, the power in our defense and our bodies. We need to have to have uh, feet wide. But in this situation, it's, of course, it's too much, but it's very marginal. It's very difficult because the line player can't stand with their feet uh, very small and, and uh, then they will lose their balance at once so um, it's it's marginal uh, and it's very difficult for the referees of course and for the pivots uh, but um, in this this clip of this this uh, photo you can see that uh, it's it's too 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 wide but as i said it's 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 marginal mm. And here we will uh, we will uh, we have done video takes about this topic, and we will try uh, or we will not try. We will put it also into the IHF rule interpretation app during the during the next year also. So hopefully we can have more uh, better guidelines and more common guidelines about what we should allow, uh, where we can say this is a good block, and what and where we have to say that this is an illegal block. That's good. Yeah. Um, and here the three, uh, three against two situation is uh, created. Uh, if we show the next picture, and then we will have a two against one. And the last picture in this sequence then ends up with the consequence of the entire thing, which is a shot from the wing position with a very good angle. And here, from such a position, the efficiency of the wings, I think, Glenn, is very, very, very high. Yeah, and that's very high. It's around 75, 80%. So. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's more or less like the efficient efficiency from the seven meter. 
A new situation for you, where we also see a little bit of the complexity about, uh, about uh, the blocking. Did I comment again? Yes, this sorry. one is for you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, what I was talking about when a line pair is just standing in front of a, a, a defender um, with wide feet, with uh, low balance, it's almost impossible to, to do something as a defender. And now he's standing uh, on the line. But, but I think... Um, too many times um, the law and the pivot and line player is getting um, penalties and two minutes in, in that kind of situations. And um, yeah, I don't know what to do about that, but maybe you can, the, the referees can whistle earlier when they see the line player is standing like this. Is that illegal or is it okay? Um, but I think, in my opinion, of course, just my personal opinion is that uh, it's very difficult for the defender when when the, when the line player is now standing in the front with these wide feet, with that balance, and just throwing him back and getting penalty in two minutes. Hmm. Of course, uh, here when we see the still picture, we have three things. That we need that we need to uh, that we need that we need to uh, have an observ observation on. First is the left arm of the pivot. Then is grab uh, holding or grabbing uh, here grabbing the shirt of the of the of the defender. Second is the width of the feet. Yeah, like we have said before, and uh, again, we need and we must provide better examples about what's a correct block and what's a not a correct block, finding criteria for what we can ac accept of feet with. But this one here is very, uh, this one is also clear. The, the width of the feet is too, they are too far apart. Third uh, aspect here is, of course, the balance point. When you see, uh, when you see the um, uh, def when you see the um, defender here, he has more or less no chance. The attacker is moving into him. So here, three reasons for whistle an illegal block. This should be an illegal block. You have to whistle it right away, but then uh, because when the the attacker is able to turn, then of course everything looks like a seven meter with the uh, with the uh, with the pivot uh, with, no with the defender inside the goal area. So again, observation and here also the court referee must help. So we really can see what is happening. Uh, so we really can see what's happening and in, and in what sequence it is happening. In my perspective as well, is here I want my defenders to work around the pivot, not not fighting with him because we are losing <laughs> losing almost uh, ten of ten with the the strong pivot. So. Mm. I'll focus on the ball. Yeah, but uh, here, here it's difficult. Uh, here it's two ways to go around him. One is then uh, passing him on the side of his left leg, which is very extended, mm. and the other way is uh, through the goal area. Mm. But uh, that's true, and that's very difficult. But if if uh, if the referee sees that. Uh, defender try to walk around and uh, get problems with that. Maybe they will, yeah, uh, whistle other things. Yeah. 
So it for the referees very very important to react on the action, not the reaction. So that means whistle for the first violation. We can show the the next one also. That will be the last one in this sequence. I think we we skip. Uh, one clip here, uh, but uh, we can show the next one here. We can show it again, show it once more since we didn't have a replay. No, 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 previous, previous, not this one. Correct. Look at the pivot here. Active. Pull, uh, pushing the defender a little bit away with wide feet. If we then go to the next slide, we also have a still picture. Here, when we see this is also very, very wide feet, and this is not because the, uh, the defender is doing the first violation. If that had been the case, by pulling the pivot towards her, of course, then the defender is guilty. But here, the pivot is using the left arm to hold the, uh, the defender away, creating uh, a clear scoring chance for herself. And you also see the, the width of the feet here. Should we take some questions, Glenn? I think we can skip uh, the two next uh, slides because uh, also because there of are, the time. There are no questions first. So uh, after that, this point of the presentation. So if you want to present also this slide, you can present it because there okay. are no questions. Like okay. Okay. Then we can also look at this one. Here, uh, an active block uh, where, uh, yeah, this is okay, but when he is putting out his left leg and then still moving into the defender, that's, uh, that's also an example of a clear illegal block. We are showing mostly examples like this, just to that we, we, need, we want an adjustment, uh, that we want more decisions against the attackers in situations like this. Um, but we don't want a revolution again. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not like we should go from whistling two illegal blocks per match if we are doing that. In most matches, it, I see it's uh, close to zero illegal blocks. But uh, we shouldn't go from two to ten but maybe we should go from two, uh, two to four, two to five. Also to tell the defenders that when you are playing according to the rules, you are rewarded. That will, that will also encourage the defenders to play more according to the rules, and that will reduce the physical play. But Is, yep. I think that's a very, very important point you, you say that because if you see that clip, you can see that uh, the defender Gulder here is trying to get around the block and then will, will the referees see the, the uh, illegal block from, uh, from the pivot. You try to get around, but you see it. So that's, that's a very good and great point. I think if we can reward good and tactical defense and not uh, the, the fighting and wrestling. Yeah, because if you are not whistling this offensive foul, then the defender uh, then the defender will think that okay, it doesn't matter. Then I can, then I can, then I can then I have to do defend myself with stronger measures. Yeah, then holding, pulling, running into him, uh, violations like that. So it's also some decisions like that, like we showed this uh, quadrant with the play, play on, big free throws, illegal blocks and punishments. It's those kind of decisions that makes us control this area as good as possible. 
Then the last part, uh, if uh, you still don't have any questions, Adrian. There is uh, one question. Um, uh, I will uh, read it just like it is. So accepting yeah. the right feet are illegal from the moment they then, then that they don't obstruct anyone but support the player. Uh, if you could clarify this. <laughs> Uh, ask the question once more, please. So, uh, why accepting that white feet are illegal uh, from the moment that they don't obstruct anyone but support the player who is doing the action? If you could please clarify this because somebody didn't understand it. Yeah, uh, uh, wide feet, uh, of course, it's not forbidden to uh to use wide feet if, if if the wide feet are not obstructing anyone then okay, then 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 of course play on but uh but when uh, you, uh, the use of a wide feet uh, of wide feet in in a in a block is obstructing the defender to move around uh for example then it's then it's a clear violation it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. For example, we are speaking about the long step with in the wing position, where also if the wing then uh, is not able to stop and then has the the foot outside his body, it's a long it's a long step, and then he's then he's guilty if it's body contact. If it's not body contact, then of course then nothing bad has happened. Then we don't have a violation. Okay, perfect. Thanks for clarifying it. Now you can uh, proceed to the next next chapter of your presentation. Yeah, and uh, this chapter is very quick. Uh, it's just showing uh, three situations with uh, a little bit more than an illegal block, but bad blocks. You can play the first one. Then we can play the second one. Here we allow here we allow the goal, but wait and look for the replay. And then the third one. Yeah, you can st you can stop uh, you can stop it there. Uh, of course, in a world championship, the referees are fully allowed to use uh, video replay, or in senior world championships, they are allowed to use video replay in uh, situations where they are in doubt if it should be a red card or not. Also, see the first first block. Uh, important to say that the, def uh, the attacker is allowed to do exactly the same as the defender. That means if the attacker hits the defender in the face in an act of blocking, it's at least two minutes, uh, two minutes suspension. If the attacker is guilty, of course, if the hit in the, in the face is uh, uh, 
action where the attacker is not guilty at all because it happens because the because of a big bigger violation from the defender it's something it's, it's something different but here in the first we have uh, not so hard contact then we are on the criteria for punishment again which is the uh, the position the part of body that's uh, hit here the face the dynamic not that big Therefore, uh, two minutes suspension is enough. But of course, if you hit an uh, opponent hard with the elbow, it's a red and blue card if you hit him hard. Next one is uh, it's a harder block uh, where, uh, where, we, where we also see it's, it's more dynamic in the situation. Unfortunately, here, not seen by the referees, they are whistling just a goal. Uh, this clearly a situation that where we can consider a red card. I think I will accept both a direct two minute suspension and a red card. Because here we have a lot more dynamic. It's a hard hit also towards the face or the head region. And that's at least an automatic two minute suspension or a directly two minute suspension according to the rules. And the last one is, of course, not a block. It's just, uh, yeah, it's a malicious action where the uh, attacker, where the attacker, the pivot player, just hit the defender in the face. And then when we speak about malicious actions that are not related to the game situation at all, like here, then we are on a red and blue card. So it's also possible to punish. Attackers, they should be punished if they do violations that you would have punished if they had been done by the defenders. Comments, Glenn? Oh, totally agree. Just aware of that you can sometimes the defender are trying or are fighting and holding hands and shoulder down and then and automatically you will do something with your <laughs> elbows and your shoulders. So um, please punish the defender as well uh, in this situation, but um, the elbows should be down. Yeah. Uh, questions, Adrian? No Before questions we... first, so no. you can proceed. Yeah, then we proceed just to the last, uh, really the last uh, slide. A little bit of the, little bit of repetition that we just we want an adjustment. When we are coming, we have to work really to find clear criteria to make it easier for the referees, to make it easier for the players, to make it easier for the coaches to really understand yeah, what, uh, what is allowed and what is not allowed. Uh, this, we, this, we are, this we are really working, we are working with. We are clearly seeing that it's necessary. For the balance of the game, um, we need more decisions against the pivots also. They are getting a little bit too much advantage now. Also, we can relate it, which has not been a topic in this lecture, but we can relate it that a pivot that is shooting under pressure or a pivot that is just falling after being pressured, not being fouled, also very oft often receive the second chance or receive the second chance by uh, getting a seven meter throw more often than we want. Uh, so, yeah, we have to change the balance a little bit. Uh, but we shouldn't change the game completely. Absolutely not. That is not what we want. But I think from uh, by this uh, now uh, 80 minutes, I think it's also quite clear that the coaching side and the refereeing side, we are quite agreeing about where we want it. Now we, now we also have to find some better criteria to really visualize uh, where we want it. Small tips for the referees then. Of course, the cooperation is essential. An active court referee 
of course it's it's not like the court uh, the goal line it's only the goal line referee that should focus in the pivot area because in most situations the uh, the players are uh, turned towards the court referee that means uh, that means it's easier for the court referee to communicate with the players of course the goal and referee must have focus here because it's mainly his responsibility to detect who's making the first mistake uh, the, the first violation but also if the pivot player is positioned uh, at the side of the court referee or if we have two pivot players or i've also seen seven against six with three pivot players I played in the Super Globe in Saudi Arabia last year. Uh, then, uh, then of course the court referee needs to take more responsibility, and then he sh uh, then he should position himself cl uh, as close as possible to the pivot that is closest to him or on his side. So also simplifies the communication, so we can solve uh, solve. A lot of these situations also with your personality, not only with the blowing the whistle. And for, but for being able to control this, we need more real decisions. That means free throws with personality. That means illegal blocks, and it means punishments when the defenders are clearly over the line. Some final remarks from you, Glenn, before we, uh, for the last time, we'll ask for questions. Uh, I have been noted uh, three things. Um, um, that's clear line for, for, for me as a coach. What's, what's, I think it's very important. It's clear line. Make decisions, as you have been speaking about. That's very easy for us to, to relate on. Uh, talk. Talk with us and the players with respect, but of course clear, but with respect and humble. And uh, whistle early to avoid difficult situations. That's three things I have been noted. Um, but um, um, thank you for having me here. And, um, and I'm happy to share some of my thoughts. Uh, I understand the difficulties, the challenging part. It's... Our sport is very, very extremely difficult. So, yeah, we need to develop together. Adrian, uh, some uh, questions. Or first, I also have to thank Glenn for uh, first for taking the time, but also the approach you have had here, where uh, I think your explanations also have been very, uh, very clear. Or and from a tactical side, also on a level uh, that we are we are not competent enough to transmit from the refereeing side, and that again just emphasizes how important it is that co that uh, coaches and uh, referees and we that are working with referees are really having a good cooperation to the benefit of the sport we all are loving so much of course with different perspectives sometimes we will still disagree but uh, we uh, hopefully we can agree about the way forward even so if we disagree about uh, about about some situations adrian questions of course thank you for uh glenn uh, sweden had a lot of success uh in the last tournaments of course uh you won some medals um, how important were the line players for uh, this uh, these performances for your team, and how did they impact? Because of course, Oscar Bergendahl came and he was very, very important, uh, and also Max Dari. So, uh, can you please tell us how crucial are the line players and having good line players into the success of a team? Oh, I think it's very, very, very important. Of course, goalkeeper, line player, and a good playmaker is uh, maybe uh, three of the most important players in a team to get the team to have a good uh, 
functional. Um, of course, our line, play, line players have been um, been very, very important in our defense play. First of all, um, Mats Dade was fantastic in, in Egypt in 2021. Uh, with uh, his, he is not the biggest one. He's not the strongest one, but he uh, have a fighting spirit and he have a very good timing in what he's doing. And of course, um, we got uh, Oscar Badgendal uh, in the European in 2022, who was also in, in defense, fantastic, uh, but also attack. Um, so uh, for us, uh, a line player is important and it is important that he plays both ways because the, the, the game is moving forward and is so fast playing so fast these days. So we need line players that uh, are running um, quick and fast and, and also can can um, play defense. Um, so, um, yeah, a line players is important that you have different skills, not only big and strong, but uh, have tactical skills and, and also a good timing and understanding and uh, a good physical. So I think also we... Um, we done some um, um, in Norway for for many years ago. We saw who which position who have the uh, the toughest uh, part, and uh, you you always will see that the pivot um, have the toughest job. <laughs> so of course it's very important for me. Thank you, Glenn. And per uh, one question for you also. Um, we've seen in other presentations, in the previous presentations, in the previous webinars, situations where the, the wings come and act as pivots. Um, how do you judge as a referee these type of situations? Because mm. the wings are not that strong. So do you mm. need to uh, pay extra attention as a, as a referee to that? Yeah, um, uh, <laughs> Very, very, very good question. And again, the question will be better than the answer. Uh, what, what I can say, and this has not been a topic here, maybe it should have been a little bit of a topic here. Uh, uh, because in the, uh, in the pivot play also, we see, and we have seen it for many, many years, we see a tendency where we have so-called mismatch situations. That means we have one uh, big player, uh, for example, uh, pivot, then going wide to uh, and then uh, position him or herself very close to the wing defender, which is normally a very small player. Or we can have the completely opposite: that uh, a wing player, a wing is going in and then starting, uh, for example, starting uh, a duel with a half defender which is st statistically is a bigger player, even if, of course, it's, uh, it's a lot of big wing players and also some small half defenders, of course. But uh, we see here that and this creates even more complexity to the decision-making because we are back to the previous lecture that a small, small player should not be allowed to do more against a big player than a big player is allowed to do against a small player. And, and finding this balance, yeah, th then we need the criteria. What are they doing? Not only looking for the effect of what has happened, but what is actually happening in the situation. Then, uh, 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 for example, uh, a wing player going into a half, uh, going into a half defender. This, even even if it doesn't have the same effect as if it had been opposite, uh, the wing uh, the the wing player is not not allowed to push the half defender, even if, even if the if the effect of the situation is more limited. If it had been opposite and the the half defender had pushed the wing player, of course, we would have had a bigger effect in most situations. So very, very good question. Uh, I try to answer it as good as I, as, as, good as I can, but it, it, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult, uh, it's a difficult topic, but in general, uh, the, the, crit the criteria is what I've tried to explain here. 
Perfect, Per. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, thank you very much for your presence, uh, Per. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent webinar once again. We will see each other tomorrow um, in the Coaches and Referees uh, Education Week with another lecture starting at 13 CEST. So thank you very much and have a good uh, day ahead. Thank you.